Mark Rogers TV back with you, continuing to preview the 2015 season. We head across the country. We check in at Ball State with head coach Pete Lembo. Coach, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Mark. It's great to be here. It's uh, it's a beautiful day here in Muncie. Good stuff. Yeah, it's beautiful in May. Let's uh, get ourselves prepared for August and beyond here. So. Two consecutive bowl games, an impressive 19 wins over that two-year stretch heading into last season. You drop off to five and seven. Is the, is the team a little anxious to get back to postseason play a little bit, maybe hungrier, maybe cranking out a couple more bench presses, getting uh, ready and prepared to uh, make amends for what happened last fall? Well, work ethic hasn't been a problem around here. We've got a great bunch of kids. Uh, we've got a tremendous strength coach. And, and regardless of, of the last season, uh, results. They have been on board since day one, and I, I couldn't be more proud of them. But I will say this, uh, a lot of guys got a baptism by fire last year. Uh, we have a lot of players that played significantly last fall for the first time. We had a lot of new coaches on our staff. Um, so there's definitely a sense of uh, a little bit more experience floating around the building right now guys understanding and appreciating a little bit more of what goes along with those responsibilities when you step into the lineup and have to play meaningful snaps, which when you go back to those 19 wins that you already mentioned in 2012-2013, in uh, some of these guys around here were on the team at that point but didn't have to play the 60-70 snaps a game that they did last year. And something you allude to here, Coach, is the difference between looking at a specific group of players, that particular team, and the results on the field, which we know five and seven could have been seven and five. And, and there's a lot of things that go into a win or two in just the 12 game schedule versus building a program and establishing work ethic, establishing an identity, a program that's going to stand the test of time. And so just talk about your philosophy and in, in getting firmly entrenched there in Muncie. Well, that's something that we've taken great pride in as a staff, whether it be as far back as Lehigh University or while we were at Elon and certainly here at Ball State. When you look at the history at Ball State, it's been a bit of a roller coaster, and we've been trying to put the pieces in place to put a competitive team out on the field every year. And it's been great working with our administration to that end. We've tried to surround ourselves with some really good kids in the program, good, solid guys. We've redshirted a lot of them. We've done a really good job retaining them. Our academic progress rate has gone up. And when guys stick around and they become a little bit more mature, hopefully that helps you uh, build some consistency in terms of your results every year. So that's what we're working towards. It's not the easiest job in America. We knew that coming in. Uh, we're certainly not uh, pleased with, with a 5-7 and seven season. But when you look at how the team grew and developed over the course of last year, I was really proud of them. We got off to a bad start. We had basically no experience at quarterback and a number of other positions. And yet, uh, despite some adversity, we finished the season strong, including a really nice win over a very good Bowling Green team. That's right. Four and two down the stretch to finish off of 2014. All right, Coach, like to get familiar with the football team, break down some personnel. So you had the makings of a quarterback battle at one point. Ozzie Mann decided to transfer. He was your starting quarterback heading into 2014, uh, had uh, the first five starts of the season. Jack Milas, just a freshman, really got some valuable experience with seven games played, 55% passer, nine TDs, and five picks. So can you talk about your quarterback at the end of last season, what you saw out of him at that point versus going through a full spring and off season and how he's progressed? Absolutely. We, uh, we put Jack in midseason because we felt like we needed a spark for our football team after that tough start and, and some close losses. And uh, Jack did some nice things, but he also showed how green he was uh, being in the lineup for the first time. Uh, I really, really liked how he handled the offseason, really started to take a leadership role in the weight room and in our offseason workouts, and, and came out this spring with a tremendous sense of purpose, was very consistent throughout the spring, had an incredibly good spring game, 21-26 for about 200 yards, no interceptions, just ran our offense very well, and I really think the rest of the unit that has a lot of experience uh, has taken to Jack and, and uh, has, has earned, uh, has built some, some trust and some chemistry. 
I'm disappointed to see Ozzy leave, but I certainly understand uh, Ozzy's a great kid, and, and obviously there can only be one starting quarterback, and, uh, and I, I really hope that things work out for him uh, transferring to a smaller school and that he gets a chance to play uh, to finish out his, his college career. So, so Jack will come into camp as our starter. Uh, David Morrison, who we redshirted last year, will be with us. Riley Neal, who is a uh, highly anticipated uh, incoming recruit, a local kid here who's a legacy for us, uh, six foot five kid with, with huge hands, a big arm, very good athlete, basketball player. Uh, Riley will be with us as well. And, and you know, you never want to count on a freshman, but I certainly hope that, uh, that Riley will come in and, and compete. Uh, but going into the season, it's certainly nice to know that you have a quarterback in Jack Miles that played in seven games, started six games, and uh, it's, it's a lot more experience than we had at this point last year. Coach, you mentioned some of the talent around the quarterback position and experience, more importantly. Jordan Williams, if my math's correct, 128 receptions the last two years. So he's been extremely productive. And uh, Keith on Maven as well at wide receiver with 59 receptions last year. So can you talk about some of the talent at the uh, skill positions? I know you lose your best running back, 1,000-yard rusher in uh, Jawan uh, Edwards, Jahan Edwards. Uh, talk about the skill positions, then we'll hit along the offensive line. Sure, Mark. You're right. Jawan Edwards was a great player for us. What a great story. We come here from Elon. He's a two-time All-State player in North Carolina, but nobody's recruiting him. Probably would have ended up at a Division II school in North Carolina. He follows us up here, and four years later is the school's all-time leading rusher. Gets his degree. He's with the Chargers now. Just a wonderful story. Um, so Jawan leaves, but we feel very good about the young tailbacks that we have. Uh, Darian Green had an outstanding spring. Teddy Williamson is a, a veteran guy for us who's a great leader in our program. James Gilbert, who is an early enrollee as a freshman. All three of those guys were very good in the spring. They're all a little bit different, but we feel like we've got some, some depth there at tailback. Uh, our offensive line is a veteran group. Jake Richard, our center, uh, is already being recognized as a uh, you know, potential All-American this season. I think he's an academic All-American, too. Um, great leader in our program, and, and, and Jake is really the key guy. But you mentioned receiver. We feel like we've got good depth there, uh, veteran guys that we can move around, Mabon, Williams, uh, Jordan Hogue had a great spring, Corey Lacken area is a good slot receiver, Chris Schillings has experience. Uh, we feel like we've got five, six, seven receivers that we can play and move around. And then at tight end, Dylan Curry had a really nice season last year. Sam Bruner, Mike Raby. So there's depth. There's experience. Uh, there's guys that played a lot last year, in some cases for the first time. But this spring, that unit had really good cohesion. We felt like we were able to do more with them, push them. And, and now even going into the season, we feel like if we do incur some injuries, We've got some guys with some experience we can fall back on. And then based on week to week, we can move some people around and, and hopefully stress some defenses. Coach, of course, it's easy to get caught up in the numbers and give attention to the guys with all the fancy stats next to their names. But 101 starts coming back on this offensive line, all five starters back. you got a couple seniors in place as backups. You seem to be very fortified along the offensive front, and those are the guys that make it all work. Well, in general, Mark, we've tried to redshirt a lot of players here. We realize we're not getting the same kids that uh, Ohio State and Michigan are. We've got to develop our players. We've had a very successful walk-on program here where we recruit a lot of in-state kids as preferred walk-ons. Some of our offensive linemen uh, are now scholarship players that came into the program uh, as walk-ons, and it's great to see those guys develop. There's nothing more satisfying for a coach than to give a walk-on a scholarship. A guy like Jeremiah Harvey, who started his college career at Division III Trine University, thought he could be a Division I player, transferred here, had to pay his way for a couple of years, and then gets put on scholarship and, and has become a good player in our lineup. So those are really satisfying things, specific to the offensive line, but just in general for us as a program, they're things we take great pride in, redshirting players, 
uh, rewarding walk-ons, trying to develop guys on and off the field. And I think our offensive line is the epitome of that. Coach, flipping to the defense, you lose uh, quite a bit of production along the defensive front, 14 sacks, 26 tackles for loss. You do have a new defensive coordinator in Kevin Kelly. Can you talk about uh, the philosophy, the energy that he brings to the table and uh, maybe how the defense might look a little bit different this year than it did in 14? Yeah, well, Kevin was with us in 14. Jay Bateman, my longtime defensive coordinator, left after the 13 season. But we also graduated a bunch of seniors off of that 2013 defense. John Newsom, who's with the Colts right now. Uh, Nate Ollie was a great D tackle for us, who's now back as a graduate assistant. So that defensive line last year was very much a, a green, rebuilt kind of unit. Uh, I thought they were better in the spring. We've got good depth there. We feel like we've got some role players that we can get in and out of the lineup. Uh, one good example would be a guy like Carlu Zaramo, who was out all last season with a knee injury. It was great to have Carlu back in the spring, giving us more depth and competition on the inside. One guy to watch, Mark, is Josh Posley. He transferred in. He's an Indiana kid that we knew from Warren Central High School out of high school. He went to Cincinnati. Um, he came back. Um, and, and had to sit out last season, and Josh had a very nice spring, so we're very anxious to see what he brings to the table. Darnell Smith is an undersized D tackle, but a guy that's played a lot for us the last three years. He's one of our best leaders. Uh, he's one of our captains for this season. So hopefully we've got strength in numbers on the defensive line. Hopefully we've got some guys that we can roll in there for different situations that can be productive for us. Coach, you mentioned leadership, and this is an interesting thing when you get into the dynamics of a team, and it's a very elusive term to a certain extent because you can't just groom leaders if they don't have it in them. A lot of it's developed, a lot of it's innate. Uh, how, how do you keep a, 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 a philosophy of trying to find those leaders and instill the, the right uh, character in those guys that you know people naturally gravitate to versus maybe there's some other guys that do the right things but uh, aren't natural leaders. And how do you, uh, with, with all the coaching experience you have, how have you seen that play out in the past? That's a great question, Mark. It's like anything else. You have to make it a priority and you have to value what it brings to the table. Uh, in our program, we're always looking for little advantages that we can create. Special teams, for example, has been a, a big deal for us going as far back as Lehigh and Elon and then here at Ball State. We spend a lot of time on it. We emphasize how important it is, and then hopefully you get some results out of it. I feel the same way about leadership. We try to recruit leaders. When you look at our signing class from last year, there's 16 team captains in that group out of 20 guys. Well, that tells you you're starting off with some guys that at least have some kind of foundation in place. They've at least been recognized by their high school coaches, their high school teammates as leaders. That gives us a chance to build on something once they get here. And then once they're here, we put a lot of time into developing the intangibles. And a big part of my role as the head coach, as the CEO, is not so much to, to call a play on third and four, but it's to make sure we're getting the most out of every player in the program. And that's a year-round process, and it never ends. We've got a leadership council that a lot of these guys through the different classes and different positions are represented on. We do a lot of leadership training with our guys in team meetings in the offseason. So you're constantly working at it, and you're constantly trying to set high standards and keep expectations high. And then from there – within the different position groups, challenge certain guys uh, to step up. But it's definitely a process. It's like anything else. And, and if you expect it to just happen, if you expect the chemistry to just happen, uh, you're, you're going to be uh, let down by what doesn't happen. So we work at those things constantly. Coach, uh, I grew up in Ohio, graduated from a Mac school. I understand Mac football. I've been around it my whole life. Uh, you, you take on the Big Ten typically 10 or 12 times a year, push them to the brink in a handful of games, usually win a couple. On top of that, the, the competition within the league that you have to deal with, you go out and you schedule Texas A&M and Northwestern. Uh, Coach, can you talk about the dynamics of scheduling and, and what the philosophy is in scheduling these types of games because you're adding two real toughies here? 
Yeah, you're absolutely right. A lot of people are fascinated by scheduling, and the first thing they have to appreciate is that so much of it is done so far down the road. We're, we're already putting games on the schedule for 2020 and beyond. So a lot of these games are in place already or maybe have been in place for, for four or five years when a, when a new staff arrives. Uh, for us, it's a lot about balance, and, and there's no question that we've got a very challenging out-of-conference schedule this year. But we talk about balance. You want to challenge yourself. You want to play a high-profile game or two every year, but you also want to try to have six home games so that your fans, your students can get to see you play. As we know, in our conference, we play some midweek games. That's great exposure for our league. It also hurts your attendance a little bit because a season ticket holder who lives three hours away might choose to, to watch that game on TV. So we want to have six home games. So we make sure if one or two of those is during the week that we've still got four to play on Saturdays to get the majority of our fan base here so that they can see us in person. When we schedule away games, a, a, a game like Texas A&M is a little bit different for us. That was a, a unique opportunity. But often, as you already mentioned, we are playing teams from the Big Ten where we can bust to those games. Our fans can get to those games. We've been really competitive in those games. We went down to the wire with, with Iowa last year, and, and uh, we were able to, to beat Indiana a couple years before that. We went to Virginia in 2013 and won that game. So we've been competitive in a lot of those Big Ten games or, or games against Power Five schools. And that's one of the neat things about our league is it's kind of a anybody, anytime, anywhere type of mentality that our program and, and the other programs in the league take on. And we take great pride in, in seeing those kind of upsets, um, those kind of competitive games that, uh, that the MAC has produced every year. Ball State coach Pete Lembo joining us. 30 wins, 20 losses in the last five years. Very impressive showing with a couple of bowl appearances in the last three and that's rarefied air uh, in the history of Ball State football. Coach, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate the time. Mark, it's been great catching up with you. Have a great summer.